right. Cool. So this is a variation of a talk I gave at DrupalCon in Drupal Camp Florida and kind of culmination of things I've been working on for the past 10 years. Um, back in the day, I would put a app, a website inside WebView, and the technology has just really grown from there, from you know, the static HTML to all the different varieties of technologies we have to basically make a browser indistinguishable from an app, if not better. So, change the title of this a bit. So, app-like web capabilities for your monolithic, decoupled, or hybrid Drupal project. And it's me and Wilfred. He's over, separated by a couple of oceans. I wanted to bring him on. Uh, part of that accessibility thing, bringing different people, cultures uh, together. So he's a great guy. We work together. Wilfred, say what's up. Hey, Alex. Hey, everyone. Cool. Um, so, we'll start off with a uh, bit of a disclaimer. You're covering a lot in this presentation. So, I'm not going to get too deep into anything. So, if I skim over things and you don't get it, don't worry about it. I actually wrote an article on this uh, subject. Most of it, uh, it's going to be on, it's on the open source, um, that com. So, there's, there's a lot there and you can always Google, look deeper into whatever we're talking about. So, it's a collection of, PWA is a collection of technologies. It's not one technology. We're talking about the browser, and there's a lot that goes into that. So it's not one language. It's, it's a lot of things. So we're going to cover that. And I'm an architect, um, been a developer. Architect, what is that? It's similar to a developer, but in some ways it's higher level, but we're putting together teams. We're managing people, skill sets, putting together everything to make a product. Uh, all the different technologies. Um, I feel like sometimes when you're just focusing on one task as a developer, you get a little bit a tunnel vision, and I'm kind of trying to see everything that's out there so I don't miss anything that's going on, the next best thing. Um, so I'm trying to select technologies that are the best to make a website behave like an app. So, and we talked about it being a little bit high level. So where are we going? This slide I used for my last talk but uh, we're going to use the PWA module as a starting point. I'm the maintainer of that module, one of them. Um, we're going to use uh, something called Google TWA, Trusted Web Activity, and WK WebView, which is an API in Swift, native iOS. Basically, just wraps your website in an app. You can get it. So we're going to cover that, get a lot of questions on that, a lot of interest on that. So we will go into it. But the most detail we'll be going into is everything you need to know to make your website basically look like an app, indistinguishable. And we're going to talk about the UX, the UI, and also a lot of these new features that are coming out uh, in the browser. That shouldn't happen. Uh, what is a PWA? What is not a PWA? So we'll go over this briefly to get into what we really want to go to. So Google and Microsoft. They're really pushing this forward. Uh, we have them to thank for a lot of the progress made. And when you have these companies behind a technology, things happen, and things are happening fast now. So it's by definition, progressive web app, you just need a service worker, needs to work offline. So you've never seen a, a native app that says that gives you the dinosaur and says um, the running dinosaur. Uh, so it's got to you remove that completely, have it work offline. Um, web manifest is just a, a JSON file, basically gives you your icons for an app. Uh, so when you click that um, home screen, you'll see the, uh, it looks like an app. So it also tells you uh, some things with like the status bar, the colors. It's mostly just markup, but you need that to pass the PWA. And uh, you'll see what I mean by that later when we look at uh, Lighthouse and PWA be able to Security just needs to be over HTTPS. Uh, service worker works in the background, and uh, there's some security concerns to take care of that. Always needs to be over uh, HTTPS. Um, PWAs are so much more, though. They're not just this, and that's what we're going to talk about. 
Uh, you can get them in the app stores. You can, there's a, a lot of different uh, features that were previously on native that you can do in a browser now. Um, web technologies, I'm talking to a friendly audience here. We're web developers. We're actually Drupal developers, so we've been around. And we've seen things that work. We've seen things that don't work. We've seen the insanity in web development, the browser wars. Some, see, we're kind of getting there again with the, the JavaScript. And we're going to talk, you know, JavaScript is great. It's been around. But um, we're going to talk about how we can kind of restore some sanity to web development. And that's going to be a point that I keep coming back to. Simplicity, sanity, make our lives easier, make better products, less time, less stress. And that uh, comes back to the single code base of what a PWA can be. And um, yeah, PWAs are also great for SEO. We're not going to get into React Native, Flutter, completely many different things. They're great. It's not um, what we're talking about here. Uh, I believe the future is in the browser. These technologies could also um, probably coexist. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball, as I like to say in the news, but we'll see what happens. I'm pretty sure the browser will be around. Um, so I actually just did the pros here. But uh, increased Lighthouse score, what are the pros and cons? Single code base, frictionless testing. When we test a website, what do we do well, we, when we make a change? We see it almost instantly on dev before we push it to live. It's really easy. You don't have to go through, submit it to the app store, go through beta testing, release it internally, um, have people download and update their apps. It's uh, make a change, push it to your uh, website, and it's there in your app. Uh, so it's really cool. It makes it a lot easier. Um, you can use deploy workflows we're familiar with. Platform as a Service, Aquia, Pantheon, Platform SH. It, it's web development. How many web developers are there? A lot. Probably the majority of developers. That's why JavaScript is so popular. So that's one of the, the benefits to PWAs is just this accessibility. Uh, there's a lot of web developers. Um, and that, that definitely counts for something, which given the popularity of JavaScript. Uh, and uh, this is an important one. So I had someone the last at the DrupalCon basically saying, so you know, what is it? What is makes it better than React Native? Is it the fact that it, it, there's a, uh, a web solution as in addition to iOS and Native? Because um, and Flutter doesn't have it. You can't create a website with those. That is really great. You can, but it's not going to be up to par as using actually developing the website. Um, so, so that's, I think, a big one. When you, when you create a PWA, you have the website, SEO, by the way. You have the, the iOS app, you have the, native, you have the Android app. Um, and yeah, you really can't, people who may, might say, oh, it's not going to look like a native app. Hey, if you're good at CS and, CSS and JavaScript, you can make a website look like anything. And that's really wh where things are going now. Uh, and yeah, it's worth noting that um, the file size of these applications is going to be really slow because you're, I mean, really small because you're basically just wrapping it in, uh, wrapping a website unless you're going to write some native code as well, which you can do. But regardless, the file size is going to be way less than um, something developed with all native technologies. And you have, uh, you're going to optimize your website with offline capabilities, which is good. Your, uh, not the best internet connection. Funny meme. Um, most interesting man in the world. Homage to, uh, to the 2010 Golden Age of Memes, which some of y'all may remember if you're Drupal developers. Uh, let's see. So we're going to quickly go over PWA module. PWA module out of the box. Gives you the offline caching. Gives you the manifest with the icons. And so you, got, you, you enable that, and you have a PWA. You have that green check mark here. You see in the lower right, um, in the light, in Lighthouse. Uh, so, and you also get that bonus for um, the Lighthouse score and performance in your website. So, so how does offline caching work? Um, how does service worker work for offline caching? Um, make a, a request to a bell. Everyone uh, knows how to type in something in the URL bar. Goes to the service worker. It's a proxy, um, not a reverse proxy, which people might 
it, which sits uh, with something like apogee. It's a proxy. That means it sits in the middle of something. So it's in the middle of you and the server, uh, your web browser. Uh, there's a function from the fetch API, which the service worker uses. Cache put. It puts uh, every, all the assets from the website uh, into this new cache, newer cache called cache API, different than HTTP browser cache, which we're used to. Have a lot more control over this cache. They call it programmable cache. Um, you, it it's, works offline, so you put it there, then you go to the network. You get your page. Second time, or in, in, if you uh, use something you know, pre-caching, you can actually do it in the background, you uh, hit the about page, it bypasses the network completely, and it goes straight to the cache, loads instantly, or if you're offline, it still loads instantly. So that's how the offline works. Uh, PWA module, this is what it looks like. Um, it's basically a pattern that can be used for other mod. Uh, it, it doesn't have to just be Drupal, but um, use, it uses the service worker, and you can cache these any URL you want on install, so even if you haven't gone to the page, uh, it'll load instantly when you go to it. It'll load in the background after everything else is loaded. With, that's what the service worker does. Um, so we just, here we're just loading the offline page. So if you are offline and you go to uh, a URL, you will get that offline page, which I'll show you. And URLs to exclude, it is still emerging technology, or sometimes you might want to not have it on certain URLs. Uh, def and so just exclude it there, and you can, uh, if you see any bugs and you just don't want to bother to debug it. Um, and cache version, uh, this allows you to basically, it's like a cache buster. So um, if you make changes to your CSS, JavaScript, you push it to live, you're gonna have to increment that each time so your users get the uh, updated version. You don't wanna enable it on dev because you'll have to keep incrementing it every time. So I have this running on a bunch of production sites, get great results. Uh, there are, it does add an extra layer of complexity, but uh, it's no, not nearly as complex as having three different code bases. Um, so, something I'm going to do here is called remote debugging. Uh, you just connect your Android. It's all well and good to do things in the browser, but if you really want to see what's going on in, in your phone's browser, sometimes uh, you, you want to get in there. So, you can basically, you can go to this, just inspect, and you see all the tabs here that are on my phone. So now we're connected to my phone here. Um, inspect. So I'm actually just going to do this in, sometimes you have to unplug this and plug it in a couple times. So I'm going to do it in my browser. So just to demo the, off, the offline behavior at the moment. So what we have here is, you see the, the service worker is active and running. And you have everything, this is cache API, cache storage for the service worker. And this is all the assets that are there. And actually, my whole computer is frozen now. I have a lot of things running, so I'm going to get Wilfred back in here. All right. All right, 
so this is uh, this when you click offline you're you're basically emulating offline and you can refresh it and you can see it still loads so if I go to a URL that doesn't exist it, it's it should show an offline page this is this is an example of a branded offline page and when when you go back online it will show page not found because that URL doesn't exist so that's a demo I was tempting the demo gods by trying to connect my phone um, I might try that again later but uh yeah so so yeah, so there was a there's an effort for the PWA module to be ported to Workbox. It's a 2.x version, and uh, it's a, Workbox is a library provided by Google. It basically wraps every all the Fetch functions in. Um, it, so you can, it, it does everything that uh, the service worker would do. It just you can do it in a few lines of code. So Google's behind it. It is so, which makes people want to use it. So, if you look at most um, PWAs these days, they're using Workbox. Uh, a lot of people don't want to use libraries, but um, it works pretty well. So, there's different cache strategies: cache first, network first, stale while revalidate. These are similar cache strategies to if you use something like Varnish. Um, cache first would be for image assets or something like that. Stale while we revalidate. That would be the default strategy. Uh, basically, you hit an asset, something for like JavaScript, CSS, um, uh, HTML. Uh, if you hit, if you hit it, it's ca you get the cache version. The second ver time you hit the request, you get the fresh version. So that's called stale row validate. And network first, obviously, you just network first. You don't go to the uh, um, the cache at all. So you might want that for. Um, for assets that are that change a lot or anything unreliable. So there's also background sync, which is cool. If you make a post request and you're offline, then you come back online. It'll make it'll it'll make the request, and that's only in Chrome at the moment. Yeah, Quick question. Oh, questions at the end. Yeah, from a Thank you. Is, so is the, does the module make a separate site alongside your regular, regular site, or do you have to start this from scratch as a new Drupal installation? That's an awesome question, and I will answer it at the end. Um, <laughs> it, it's the same. It's the same site. It, it basically just it just adds a service worker. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate that, though. And um, we got to make time for Wilfred. Uh, so basically, you can get these in the App Store. Another funny app. Basically, you put it. Uh, another funny meme. Basically, you're putting a website in an app. Um, so Google has something called TWA Trusted Web Activity. They're pushing this forward. They're all in on the on the progressive web app. Uh, iOS. They don't even use the word PWA at the moment or Apple. So, but they do have WK WebView, which actually provides you all these abilities to put your website in an app and they, and, uh, they actually have a function uh, to basically bridge um, web and native and that's what Ionic uses and that's what a lot of these new frameworks are using. Turbo has one, which I'll talk about later. Uh, so basically, Microsoft has a framework called, uh, or a website rather, called PWA Builder. You take your PWA ready URL, you run it through the, the um, PWA Builder and you get your APK you get your IPA for iOS. You can customize it. You got their code, and uh, makes things really easy. So people like this a lot. Let's see if the computer doesn't crash again. So you see, I have this set up. Here's the URL we looked at later. It's just all it's just linking directly to the already entered URL, and it's got the manifest with the icons, which is just the JSON markup. Um, it's got the uh, service worker works offline, okay, so it's got HTTPS, okay, it's a PWA, I can build it. So this is all just from the same website, it's all one website, one code base. 
and we're using this URL as the example, uh, it, nothing changes. It's still the same URL. It just um, adds the service worker, the manifest. So now you see uh, PWA Builder. It, you, can, you can download Android app, you can download iOS. Android uses TWA, it's something called Trusted Web Activity. You've seen it before, I'll show you a demo. And iOS uh, uses WK WebView, which is essentially a workaround. Uh, okay, so here's an example of Trusted Web Activity without submitting it to the App Store. You say you, you just have the PWA module right now installed. Um, you've seen this probably before, it, probably in the last three years. Um, so I'll show you that to you again. You missed it. Add home screen, install, and you're not going to the App Store at this moment, you're, it's, so it's not discoverable. But you can submit it to the App Store, so you have two options. You can uh, just install the PWA module, you get the add to home screen, or you can get the APA, APK and submit it to the App Store. Quick go over this slide. So we're not supposed to focus on that too much during this presentation, but people are really interested, how do I get my PDA to the App Store? So basically, when you, when you have um, an APK and you submitted a TWA app into the App Store, uh, what do you get? You get everything that Chrome browser has. So you get autocomplete, you get everything in Chrome browser. So um, it's, it's really great to do that rather than an alternative, which is which you can wrap it in WebView, which is just the native iOS, native Java code itself. Uh, you want to use TWA for a couple, it just makes, you can use um, Chrome, it's feature complete, and everything new that comes out in Chrome, you can use. Um, iOS is a little bit different. You got to use WK WebView, that's what uh, PWA Builder does, or you can do it custom. You can use Ionic, which is a framework that does this. Turbo has a framework that does this. Uh, basically, wraps your app in, in this Swift um, API, and you have some cool things. So when you, when you swipe it, it's not going to bounce. It's not going to look like a website at all. Uh, and you can, right here, uh, there's a function in Swift, evaluate JavaScript. You can basically bridge anything uh, with native and web, and web if, uh, by interacting with JavaScript. And uh, you can set cookies, then the native code can read the cookies, detect the cookies, do different behavior for different pages. Uh, you can set the status bar, to different colors, depending on the page. You have a lot of ability to customize. So even though I, uh, Apple isn't talking a lot about PWAs, they provide a lot of um, uh, fun flexibility and functionality in WebKit, w which is WK. WebKit, WebView. Um, uh, so, you know, Safari is based on WebKit. Uh, WebKit's open source, open source movement, really does want to push PWAs forward. So that is happening. Um, previously, there was no push notifications. It, that's ha in iOS. So, you know, you don't want a PWA for that. Now they're coming out with that. They have push notifications that they're working on. Um, WebAuthn, which is biometric fingerprint, that actually has support, uh, so you don't have to do custom implementation. This screenshot, you can see custom implementation of biometric that I've worked on, but pretty soon that's all gonna be in the browser. Safari, based on WebKit, open source, is getting pushed forward even though Apple itself isn't pushing it forward. They rely on WebKit. So unless they make some big changes there and they, they fork WebKit or something to purposely fill, kill PWAs, it's going to be it's going it's going to be going forward. I, I, so I don't see that happening. Um, so that's good news. Uh, so yeah, an app it's PWA. It's just browser. I mean that's what web that's what um, TWA is. So this is where we're really going to focus on. Um, it's different from other presentations. Making a website app like and. Um, 
Yeah, we'll get into that. So it's worth mentioning a lot of that is UX, making the look and feel of your website feel like an app. It's something often disregarded. People focus so much on uh, functionality that they end up with a really cool functional PWA, but it doesn't look anything like an app. So people are not happy. So it, it, consumers, your customers, users, whatever, they really like things to look and feel the way they should, like an app. So sometimes this is psychological, using preloaders or content placeholders when things are loading. You can see that all the time in native apps. Um, so be, these are really important, and, and when you do them on the web, just like on native, then you, you get a, a experiences that is pretty indistinguishable and uh, can stay sane with that single code base. Uh, one thing that does add a little extra complexity is because you know, we remember the browser's words, it's not quite the same as that, but you have to keep up to date with what iOS and, and Chrome are doing um, yeah, to basically uh, make, um, it, it's constantly changing, so just sometimes just go and stack overflow, see if something's changed. It might always be the first answer, but it, it should be the most recent answer. So you want to look for the most recent um, information in uh, any, any sort of CSS tricks or techniques um, to, to make the uh, UX what you want it. But it's there. If you spend a little time looking, it's there. And that's you know the flexibility of the web. If you're an experienced web developer, you can pretty much make a website look like anything. Um, and uh, Project Fugu is a something is a program by Google. Um, they're really adding different enhancements to the browser. Uh, it goes all the way to web and fingerprint, push notifications, um, uh, background sync. It's rapidly trying to push the browser forward. They 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 have no you know closed loop system like the App Store. That is keeping them from pushing this forward. They want the, they want this technology to be pushed forward because it's the best technology, not because they have some financial. And I'm not saying Apple does this, but you know, essentially everyone's saying that, and it's kind of obvious. So uh, you really can't stop progress, and uh, people want a browser experience that does everything native can do. Uh, finally, another uh, in important um, aspect of a PWA is speed. You want it to be fast. App native apps are fast usually. I know I've used a lot of native apps that are not as fa not that fast, um, but uh, you know, the, the browser can be even faster than native at times. Okay, this slide. There's a lot going on here. You might want to Google some of these things afterwards. But CSS, HTML, J JS. A lot goes on to make your website look like an app, and there's it's all over the board. So you have to kind of bring everything together. And uh, just like any web development, there's so many different technologies, you bring them together, you make the product. And, that, and that's what we're talking about here, bringing together different technologies to make the product. So we're talking viewport meta tags, um, uh, it, it, you know, you don't, when you have your app, you don't want to be able to pinch it and zoom, that's a telltale sign that it's an app. And that can be taken care of. Um, CSS with the flashes and style content. These, you can find this in Lighthouse, which we'll go over later. Uh, loading animations, like we talked about before. Uh, the, uh, HTML5 attributes, having um, the proper password and autocomplete uh, attributes. So you know when you when you click your password, it auto fills. These are all things that make the experience so much better. They're really not that hard. You just got to bring them together, research them. I wish there was one central place where you found all this information. There isn't at the moment. Google's got web.dev where they have a lot of this information, but I'm kind of working on getting all this information in one place. There's, a, there's another guy, Maximilian Furtman, who documents a lot of information that comes out with PWA. So anytime you want to kind of find something, he's good for that. But there is really no good single API for the complete scope of the web. Uh, Google's doing a pretty good, good job doing that in web.dev, so that's the closest we have. I'm kind of trying to contribute to that. Web OTP is really cool, like autofill the SMS, that used to only be in native apps, now it's in the browser. 
you know, you want your input types to have the numbers. You don't want it to pull up the keypad when you're typing in a number or a phone number. So these are all things that you need to consider and that you, you remember. And they're pretty easy to find with, with some digging on Google. Um, iPhone before iPhone 8, you had the corners. Now you got the rounded corners on a website that can cause a little space up top when you're in full screen. So there's ways to take care of these things. Uh, Ajax API, we'll talk about this later, but Drupal, it, you don't have to be decoupled. Uh, Ajax um, is a great solution for that uh, with Ajax API. And now there's something called Turbo, which is very similar to React, which uses um, it's HTML over the wire. There's frameworks specifically created to make, um, to, to solve this problem. Onsen UI framework, Seven is one of them, if you want to check those out. They basically, uh, they make uh, your website, uh, they account for, um, so, yeah, so here you can see what it looks like on Android, and they, they try to make the UX look specific to that device. So there's people trying to solve these problems. Every, uh, everything's happening here. Uh, so it's just up to you to decide what you want to choose. And that's kind of what I'm, so, so now we'll, uh, Wilfred will take it and he'll talk about um, Lighthouse, which is uh, one of the ways that we talked about to improve the UX and feel of an app. Wilfred, are you with me? Hey Alex, could you mind uh, placing the camera towards the screen so that I can see the slides? Um, I cannot move my laptop or things will get unplugged. Okay. Can you not see the screen? Nope. Oh, I'll share the screen. How's that? Let's try that. That good? Yeah, there you go. All right. Thanks, Alex. Take it away, man. <clears throat> Hello there, everyone. Um, so uh, I know Alexa has talked a bit about the performance, and I would like to start from there. So performance is a vast topic in itself, but, uh, and we may not be able to cover everything today. But uh, what I want to show you uh, or rather uh, share with all of you here is uh, those some of the steps that we have uh, taken to help one of our client to get the more improved light of score. Uh, and there are various aspects of uh, performance, right? It's kind of different dimensions uh, in itself. Uh, when you talk about performance, there will be, uh, there can be uh, scalability, there can be um, high availability, there can be a lot of things. So uh, here, uh, let me show you how uh, or what are those steps that we have uh, that have we have made for improving the lighthouse score and uh, this uh, particular platform is completely built on a javascript framework and more than three-fourths of the contents are served from drupal <coughs> so it, it's a very good example in uh, you know uh, showing how, how uh, to improve the light of score so uh, the first thing uh, first and foremost uh, thing what we have done is to reduce the time to interactive and <clears throat> to reduce this uh, first contentful pain right so there are various uh, things which will affect your uh, uh, which will affect your time to interactive and also that that's the main experience when a user goes to the browser and then uh, access a particular page if it's more than three seconds typically the user will be losing interest of that site right so we've heard this a lot. So uh, typically what we do is we'll have to uh, probably think about reducing the DOM size or maybe uh, introduce things like lazy loading and stuff like that. So uh, DOM size can be uh, huge due to uh, more than a couple of reasons. In fact, uh, it can be huge because uh, the JavaScript that you are using is actually generating more markups. It can be huge because uh, maybe the page itself is huge. Maybe we'll have to uh, structure the page 
in a better way, and this in fact affects the SEO as well. So <clears throat> maybe there's a huge landing page where we'll have to segregate that, and maybe we'll have to create a sub page of that, right? So these are a couple of things that we have done to um, uh, improve the the, uh, the the what you say to lower the time to interactive. And uh, the next uh, thing is <clears throat> uh, there there can be a lot of third party JavaScripts that will be running on your website. There's no hiding away from third party JavaScripts and there can be uh, times where uh, to establish this connection, it takes a bit of more time. So uh, typically what we uh, did there is we added, uh, uh, we added a pre-connect um, and we added a DNS prefetch to uh, establish early connections. So these, these are simple, uh, um, Strings that you add onto the uh, link uh, REL attribute. So in that in that manner, we uh, we uh, we uh, got the uh, got the third party uh, JavaScript to load uh, in a in a uh, better in a lesser time. Uh, the other thing is uh, the static assets. Now, um, when we talk about static assets, especially images, uh, we uh, we want to make sure that uh, the images are optimized. For example, uh, there need not be a higher resolution image for a thumbnail. Um, and there, uh, there, we, we really want to make sure that the images that we are using um, uh, on your site is having the format of WebP and SVGs. We don't, we don't really want to use PNGs and JPGs because that takes uh, much more time to load. And also, uh, effectively, you have to probably Im increase the TTL <clears throat> of these images. So that goes on to the, uh, that, that you'll have to be, maybe add on to the CDN. Uh, typically, uh, what Lighthouse suggests is that uh, at least the TTL of a static image has to be one year or more. And uh, that, will, that can considerably uh, reduce the, uh, your cellular data, right? Um, the next one is to reduce unused JavaScripts. So that's again a main problem. So there can be some JavaScripts that we don't use in the whole uh, website. Uh, typically, the unused JavaScripts can be compared to uh, ca can be categorized in two things. One is uh, this non-critical JavaScript, and the other one is dead JavaScript. So dead JavaScript are those are those JavaScripts which are not used anywhere in your website. So that can be easily removed. And the other one is non-critical JavaScript. Non-critical JavaScript is, uh, uh, there is uh, those JavaScript where um, some, of, uh, uh, some of the JavaScripts that, uh, that there are not used in the current page. So this can be, again, uh, split into two different sections, like your critical JavaScript and non-critical JavaScript. And these non-critical JavaScript can be used only where it actually requires. So in that, it, again, it will considerably uh, improve the score and, and the page load time. Then the other factor can be your huge, uh, enormous uh, network payload, right? There can be some areas where uh, it, it gives a very huge payload. And um, in that case, what we have to do is we'll have to uh, compress this payload. So we'll have to add a, a header, effectively uh, a gzip header uh, uh, in, in, into your server so that these payload can be compressed and it, it will be uh, overall, the overall performance of the, uh, the page would be even more better. So these, these are some of the aspects that we have, uh, we have done and there are a lot more uh, so the the good thing about about lighthouse is that it gives you ex it shows you exactly what to be done you are not stuck anywhere uh, thinking uh, what's the solution and everything so this is how uh, a perfect um, not a perfect a, a better 90 more than 90 score would look like and uh, uh, alex can you uh, go back to that uh, lighthouse generation 
And we had a 90 earlier today, but um, I guess oh. the internet's kind of slow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so here, um, there, there are a lot of, uh, uh, the, the score is pretty good, uh, but there are a lot of opportunities still, right? So like, it, it, uh, it's suggesting to use, um, to eliminate rather render blocking resource. And the good thing here is it also suggests you to use the extra Drupal module for that. Right, and if you scroll down, like, it, it also uh, talks about using HTTP2. HTTP2, so that, that's another uh, thing uh, we can add. It's Reduce on new CSS. Again, it's, yeah, again, again, it's uh, suggesting for a Drupal module. Um, so there, there, are, there are a lot of uh, factors here. And uh, that's how effectively we can, uh, you know, in improve the Lighthouse score. Cool. So that's Lighthouse. And you can see because we have the PWA module installed, we get that check mark. And like these things, I mean, never know, no one knows exactly what happens in the black box of Google's SEO, but it's been said that this helps SEO. Um, so yeah, we have the, you see the manifest is, the meta tags are there. So... We get the SEO, the uh, PWA checkmark in Lighthouse as well, provided by the PWA module. Okay. Let's okay. Talk about web worker. So uh, moving on, moving on to web worker. So web worker is uh, another cool aspect that we have uh, implemented in in this uh, uh, particular website. So what a web worker does is your your heavy loaded, your heavy uh, weight. APIs or whatever background uh, scripts that you want to run, right? So uh, where if maybe these scripts is uh, affecting your browser speed, and this is reducing the user experience. So all those heavy scripts can be added in, in the background. And uh, the web worker, the way the web worker works is the data is sent between uh, a worker and a thread via a system message. So that's a post message, and that's how it uh, goes back and forth from a background to an actual web page code. Can you cool. move on to the next slide? Yeah. And uh, web, in, in this instance, Web Workers is used for um, offline, I mean, not offline, but uh, pre-caching, which uh, service work can also be used for. So before you visit the page, it loads even faster. Right. Okay, so then we move on to uh, decoupled uh, and monolith app-like behavior. So uh, the Drupal, uh, the, the greatest thing about Drupal is uh, we can mix and match the Drupal architecture. You can have a unified architecture, you can have a headless CMS, a decoupled app, or a static site, right? And there are other CMS away out there in the market which Go specific towards the headless, or which is goes, which is going specific towards uh, a monolithic uh, structure. But Drupal, uh, you can have a mix of all this, and uh, a decoupled in a, a decoupled application. What what we can achieve is Drupal can be a backend, and it can serve all this uh, contents to a frontend React app, for example, or a frontend Vue.js app, and uh, and all this uh, PWA aspect that Alex talked about can be incorporated in this uh, front end, right? And that helps to improve uh, the browser experience. And if you move on to the next slide, Alex. Yeah, so the way the decoupled Drupal works is there is a request on the API endpoint. The, the, the API endpoint is exposed by the Drupal. Um, your front-end app would request to that API endpoint. The back-end then serves and prepares the data. Uh, the front-end uh, is not really uh, bothered about what happens on the back-end. The front-end then renders the data, and the uh, application UI exposes the results. So that, that's the typical workflow of how a decoupled app works. So the real difference with 
a decoupled and a coupled is uh, basically the consumer or your front end is completely independent of the CMS. And this can be bridged by a JSON a service layer, typically a JSON API or a REST endpoint. Next slide. Okay. And uh, Drupal gives you a wide variety of service layer integrations. Uh, so these are the service layer integration that's provided by Drupal. Um, the first two, that is uh, RESTful and JSON API are added in core, and it also comes uh, by default with all the caching, the roles and permissions, the authentication, and everything uh, Drupal offers. You, you, just, you get that by just enabling that module, and basically a few clicks. With a few clicks, you can achieve a decoupled uh, Drupal. The uh, next one that's talking about the GraphQL. GraphQL is another contract module which is growing, uh, growingly, uh, increasingly uh, popular uh, day by day. Um, that that's also uh, a type of service which we can use, especially if you want your developer experience to be more. Uh, low code query builder, aka views, Drupal views. Um, so Drupal views provides you the easiest of ways you can expose uh, a REST endpoint, right? Let's say a customer who, who's not sure about whether to go with a decoupled um, architecture, but, but they might want to just try some couple of components or a couple of pages uh, on their website to serve to, the, to, the, uh, to a third party consumer, right? So in those situations, uh, uh, you just create a view and then expose that, and your job is done. So that, that's how easy the view uh, is. And the last is uh, custom coding. Of course, uh, if all this is, uh, uh, um, if you want a custom endpoint, and uh, if you want a custom service layer integration, you can go with a custom code, and programmatically you can create a controller and all those stuff. So uh, that, that's all on the service layer integrations, and uh, with that, I hand it over back to Alex. Cool, Wilfred, that's awesome. So what I'm going to talk about now, some of you probably haven't heard about, if you Google it, HTML over the wire, it only 2020, 2022 is going to come up. The first article was written in 2016. But it's going in a complete different direction. So it gives very similar results to what you'd expect from an SPA, using techniques that have been around for quite a while. We all remember Ajax. Uh, now, um, you know, instead, so basically an alternative approach to building modern web applications without using much JavaScript by sending HTML instead of JSON over the wire. Wow, like why is that so groundbreaking? It, it's, this is, technology has been around forever. Um, we've had it, you know, I, bu I built an app that's actually quite popular right now. And it's, it's on Drupal. And we use the Ajax API for everything. So when people use it, they think it's an they think it's a native app. We're just using the Ajax API. HTML over the wire takes that to a whole new level, and they they basically refresh whole they call it frames parts of a web page using something similar to Ajax. So Turbo, uh, there's a company you might have heard of it. 37 Signals was a web development agency. They ended up building a product that got really popular, Basecamp. Now they're they're in the product game. It's it's a little better. It's a, in my opinion, it's a better place to be than the agency game. You have a product. So now they have they they're just trying to push technology forward. Um, they they don't really have any sort of. Uh, they're not trying to sell services. So you know they created a little framework called Ruby on Rails for Basecamp. Open source it. Now they're working on something called Turbo which is, it's a suite of tools, and uh, let's see, let's open it up. Um, it's a suite of tools that basically does what a lot of people are focusing on, and what I'm doing in this talk, it to make a uh, website feel like an app. Uh, it does this through uh, they have a bunch of different technologies. Um, 
and it, the, their main one is Turbo. Uh, so here's their website. Um, to drop, they, they have different um, APIs, frameworks, whatever. And it all comes together to to basically make this uh, goal of making a website look like an app. So frames decomposes the page into independent context, which just got to the center of that holes. Um, so that gives that um, kind of uh, uh, that that what React does, which it just um, refreshes the, the the area that that you want rather than the whole HTTP request. Um, they have other they have a little JavaScript library to kind of make things look more app like. So all this is all coming together under the under the pretense of trying to make a website look like an app, single code base, make life easier. Uh, accelerate development. And they even have something called Turbo Navid, which is essentially WK WebView and, and I, some version of Ionic that they're working on as well. So the um, less code you use, the better. There's reasons for this. Uh, less places for bugs to hide. Um, uh, save time and sanity by not having to write every line of code that creates HTML JavaScript, which we, you would use in an SPA. Render a full page when the user navigates, but then only fragments of that new page are inserted into the DOM. Sounds similar, kind of like React. Uh, and then uh, 30 Seconds Singles has this great article called The Majestic Monolith. You know, we're talking to Drupal Camp here. We're on this same boat. We're, we're, we, we love Drupal for that reason. Um, and uh, uh, so the guy who coined the term microservices, uh, I was going <laughs> to remember his name for the talk, but you can Google it. He coined the term microservices, so he's kind of uh, looked to as an expert in that field when you know all this, everyone wants microservices decoupling. And everybody wants that because it's what Uber is doing. I want to do what Facebook's doing. I want to do what um, Google's doing. I want to do what Uber is doing. 99% of applications are not that. Even if you're a large corporate website or application, you don't, you probably don't need microservices. So the recommended approach you start with the monolith, and then you switch things out. Maybe you start, you throw the users in Amazon Cognito, or maybe you decouple it. Maybe you start, maybe you have an RDS database for some a high traffic database. But you don't have to decouple everything, spreads codes everywhere, makes things a little crazy. So using uh, HTML over the wire, you can get, uh, you can stay coupled and you stay monolithic, and you can get a lot of these. Uh, SPA type functionality. And I will do another quick demo of that because yeah, I like making my life difficult. So um, basically this is what this is what it looks like. You can base you know you, you can you Alex? Yeah. But, you know, we're past time. Oh, we're past time. All right, y'all can go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wanted to give you a minute or two of questions if you wanted. All right, any questions? So this is refresh list. So you can see there's no there's no link, and there's um, this is just using Ajax right now, but we're going to move towards WebSockets. So I'm working on uh, with this uh, developer Matei Stanka, who's doing a lot of work on this. So you can see when you click, you, it uses cache context which is only uh, available in Drupal 8, and it just refreshes these frames, just the frames, and you can send this over Ajax, HTML, XML, HTTP request object, or you can, now they're using WebSockets, and that's what we're trying to move towards. So this is all in a coupled CMS. There's no, there's, there's nothing, um, no SPA there, and it basically gives the exact same effect. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, loading icons, they're everywhere. That's basically what this talk is about. And follow these guys. Quick question. Is, is there any chance in hell that'll make it into core? Into core? I have no idea about that stuff. <laughs> I don't even want to get involved with that politics. You know, like, I think Drupal is great the way it is. Keep it in a module. I don't have time for getting things into core. But once but, it goes into core, it moves slower. Exactly, so good point. You want it in contract. Totally. Good point. Thanks so much, Alex. Yeah.
Gracias.